Well, welcome back to another session of Literal Genesis, where here we strive to hold firm to Scripture and hold loosely to theories. Um, as we've discovered uh, many times over, the theories of man and, and flawed humans, they change all the time, and it happens that way in science. So it's better to hold firmly to Scripture. So anytime Scripture touches on something like biology, which we're talking about now, that's what we want to hold firmly to, uh, the more likely to get our science right, if that's where we start from. So we're going to continue on with our conversation from last time, where we, we had this analogy of, of how to build an airplane, and how to take uh, all these manuals and not just build the airplane itself, but the tools and, and not just the tools, but how to mine for the parts and how to create the refineries to make the oil byproducts. And we ended up with all these manuals. And then we introduced Evolution's engine, which I like to call Evolution's extinction engine, which when that's introduced, I compared it to a blind three-year-old with a marker and a t uh, some pair of scissors and a tape and just randomly making changes to our, our perfect instruction set. And we talked about how over time that's never going to lead to a better airplane. It's never going to lead to new functions that the airplane couldn't do before. But we said over time it's going to take a perfectly fit airplane and it's going to just degrade it over time to where it eventually it won't be able to fly at all. And de depending on where those first changes are made, it may be very quickly for that airplane not to be able to fly. So we're going to pick it up from there. And we're going to switch gears just a little bit. And I say gears uh, kind of loosely because we're actually going to be talking about gears. Uh, no pun intended there. And in order to do that, we're going to look at uh, something in biology in a, in a bacterium. It's called the uh, flagellum. And if you take a look down here, this is... A kind of a representation of a single-celled organism. It's a bacterium um, that scientists have found uh, in, in a fossil, in a fossilized form. Notice all the these tail-like structures that come out from the end of it. Now they're not really called tail, they're, they're called flagella, the, the plural of, of flagellum, um, when we're talking about biology. So they're, they're flagella. Uh, I'll probably still call them tails because that's what they look like. And the, these, these tails, they, they whip around and they propel. They cause the, the single-celled organism to move. They give it motion. And in order to drill in to how these things operate, if we take a, a look up here at the left, we have a three-dimensional uh, picture here of what's at the base of one of these tails. And notice the assembly here. This, this, is, this is all proteins. Right, so remember we talked about how when the body needs a part or a tool, it has to go manufacture it. These are some of the parts that it manufactures. And we've given labels to these parts, but look at the nomenclature here. So again, this is, this is like an outboard motor, if you will, on, on a boat. We have a rotor. So we call that a rotor because it rotates. It's the rotation part uh, of this motor. So it rotates, and then we have a stator. Same terms we use on when we talk about motors today. The stator is stationary, so it doesn't rotate, but these cogs turn and, and, and everything kind of works together to make this thing turn. And if we look over here at the two-dimensional drawing of it, we can see how it's embedded in the membrane of the cell. So the, instead of an outboard motor, it's kind of like an inboard motor where the motor itself is, is on the inside of the cell uh, and then the tail is on the outside. And if you can, as you can imagine, all these parts must fit together perfectly, not loosely. Uh, they can't wear out, you know, after a few seconds. Uh, that would not be very efficient at all. Uh, but they work perfectly, and there's systems in place to maintain it. So as parts do wear out, they can be replaced, or the, the whole thing could be torn down and recycled. Um, but if this didn't fit loose, if this didn't fit tightly inside the membrane and kind of loose and wiggled around, well, that wouldn't work very well either. So this complete system is really amazing. And we use the same terminology again when we're talking about uh, motors today, uh, outboard motors. But this is why I picked the 747 uh, airplane to talk about in our previous illustration. This so-called simple bacterium has nearly the same number of parts as that 747, about 6 million. Now this is absolutely mind-boggling. We talked about how complex the manual was to make the 747 completely from scratch. It's no difference in this so-called simple single cell back. This is a single cell, right? We're multi-cell. This is just one cell, and it's highly, highly complex and has around 6 million parts, which must fit together and work perfectly together just like the airplane, or the airplane doesn't fly, or the bacterium doesn't survive. 
But there's one thing that just simple, and I say simple, when I say that, it's always going to be in quotes. When I'm talking in, about biology and I use the word simple, just automatically know that's in air quotes, right? There's nothing simple about it. But this simple cell can do something that the airplane cannot. It can reproduce itself. It can make copies of itself. It can make other single-celled uh, organisms that operate independently and have its own set of DNA. Absolutely mind-boggling with six million parts. So anytime somebody tells you that uh, these, these cells are simple or so, you know, they can spontaneously arise, uh, uh, which is another key word, by, by the way, whenever you hear the word they spontaneously arose, spontaneously arose in the literature, um, as Dr. James Turr likes to say, that's code for we have no idea. Whenever something spontaneously arises, and you'll see this a lot in the literature, it really means they have no idea because there's never any details behind it. How something like this could spontaneously arise is, is beyond my, my scope of thinking. And this quote here comes from Mark Rose, who's a pilot uh, and technician. Taking a closer look at this gear assembly that was found. This was found in the M01. This is the, the fossilized bacteria that I talked about. So this is the M01. And we're looking at these flagellum. Notice the uh, hexagonal array of these motors, these, these, large, uh, these larger motors here. There's seven of them arranged in a hexagon. And if you look in between them, there's 24 smaller gears. What you're looking at is a planetary gearbox. This is something that mechanical engineers are very familiar with. They create them all the time. Uh, we find these all over the place, right? This takes human design to make this, but yet we're to believe that somehow through a chance process that nature built this blindly over some eons of time. That's absolutely incredible. Now you'll notice uh, we call it a planetary gear system because uh, we have the larger gears here uh, surrounded by smaller kind of satellite gears, kind of like a planet uh, or sun and, uh, and planet satellites. And if you look at the arrows, you can see the direction. These larger ones rotate counterclockwise and the smaller ones rotate clockwise. So it all has to fit together perfectly and rotate perfectly or, or it doesn't work or the tail doesn't spin, the bacterium doesn't move, it can't get to where its food source is and it'll eventually die. So this, this system must be in place in order for the single cell to, to, to live. These seven engines, they're more than just gears, these larger ones. These are actually engines because they're powered by, by protons. These seven proton powered engines here and all of it must work perfectly and fit together. And to make this incredible, this bacterium was found in a rock that supposedly is 3 billion years old. Now let that sink in just for a second. Something this intricate, right, was found in something supposedly 3 billion years old. That's not much younger than the Earth, right? The Earth is around the, the same time frame, uh, 3.8 billion, if you know, let's just call it 4 billion years old. So somehow this single cell appeared on the scene long before the Cambrian explosion. If you remember that from high school, that's the, that's the, the layer in the fossil record. We find all these different phylum all together right there, fully formed from the beginning. This goes back before that, something this intricate, supposedly. Now I don't believe in those, those time frames and those long ages, but if I did, this is absolutely something impossible to believe. Um, that this flagellum has all these biomotors and they're there right from the beginning uh, with no, um, no path of evolution that we can, we can see in the rocks. So let's take a closer look at this uh, uh, bacterial flagellum motor. And what I wanna do is compare it to an, an electrical synchronous motor. Now I, I flipped this on its side so that they could both have the same orientation to kind of kind of make them match up a little bit. But but you'll notice they have the same types of words. They have rotors. They have they have stators. Now I want to ask this critical question. I, I'm always saying we need to be critical thinkers, and what that means is well, number one, we have to be curious, right? We need to ask questions, but but ask the hard questions. Ask the the elephant in the room type questions, and that's regardless of the source, whether it's coming from an evolutionary ideologist or coming from me, uh, as you're reading scripture, be curious, ask questions. You will learn, you will grow from it. And the question that I wanna ask here, looking at these two motors, is which motor can create itself? Can either one of these motors create itself? Now, no one would say that the, the synchronous electrical motor could create itself. 
When I ask this to people, I mean, I've have yet to say someone tell me, well, yeah, you put enough metal together in a room, you shake it together long enough, and you'll get a motor out of it. Nobody ever says that. But again, for some reason, because this one is, is built on biochemicals, bio parts, that it can somehow assemble itself. That doesn't follow for me. Let's ask another critical question. We have a manual for this electrical synchro synchronous motor. I've already been told by everybody I asked that there's no way the motor can create itself. Well, let me just take it a step further. Could this manual create itself? so that you can have workers who can read the manual and produce more and more and more motors uh, as we need them. No one ever says that either. We've already talked about that in the last session. Manuals do not create themselves. It doesn't matter how much time you give them, they have never been known to create themselves. Well, what about the manual for this motor? There is a manual for it. There's a manual for all these parts. There's a manual for the workers that know how to read the manual to create the parts to assemble them at the right time in the right place. Uh, this is DNA. That's what DNA is. Could you think that manual could write itself? Now here's where we get a different answer. The answer is always, yeah, I could see that. Why is that? Oh, because it's, it's chemical. It's chemistry based and chemicals have an attraction to one another. Okay, granted, but where does the code come from? Chemicals know nothing about the code in which they carry any more than the paper knows anything more about what I've written the paragraph on. It has no idea. It's just a medium. DNA is the medium, right? Where did the code come from? Well, we'll look at that more deeper, but this is a critical question, which I think I want more people to ask. I want more young people to ask, right? How do these things just, just write themselves over time? And if you think they do, show me, show me how this happens. Cite a paper where they've done it in the lab and showed where it happens. It doesn't exist. You won't find it anywhere. Now going back to, to David in the Psalms. So now that we've gone a little bit deeper and we've seen how complex just our, our manual is to build a 747, and yet it's about the same amount of parts as that single cell bacterium. We're made up of much more parts as humans. David says, I will give thanks to you because I am awesomely and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works and my soul knows it very well. Again, I don't think David had a biology textbook. He didn't know anything about DNA, uh, didn't know anything about uh, you know, the codes and the languages of the DNA. But all he had to do was, was look at how marvelous the human body is with the amount of knowledge that he had and immediately give credit to his creator. We should take note of that. So in summary, DNA is a set of manuals, not just for us, but in that blade of grass outside, in that tree, um, in, in those insects, right? In the mammals, uh, in the sea creatures, everything, every living organism has DNA and it uses the, the same code, the same code in everything. Now, an evolutionist may say, well, that's because everything evolved from the same thing. Whereas someone who believes that codes don't create themselves would say, well, they just had a common a designer. Whoever created the code used the same code throughout the creation. I was uh, a developer for a number of years, so wrote code, uh, developed programs. This is very true. Once you have a good set of code, a good function that works, you're going to reuse that over and over again as a building block. It's the same thing we see in DNA. So again, summarizing, it's, it's, a, it's an instruction set on build an entire human, how to build an entire human, and not just build that human, but how to maintain them, how to diagnose when things go wrong. We have self-diagnosing happening, happening all the time within our bodies. Uh, how to correct things when they go wrong. It's not perfect. We'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. How to build the workers who know how to read the DNA so that they can carry out the instructions. It does you no good to have the DNA, a complete set of DNA, the instructions, and you have no workers in the cell that understand how to read it, how to build from it. Those two must exist at the same time. And as we talked about building the raw materials uh, for our airplane, the manufacturing process, the refining process, and then this is done at a massive scale within our bodies. So we're, we're made up of, and this number changes um, virtually every year or every few years, but, but now the current thinking is that the average adult has about 70 trillion cells that makes up their body. Um, about 40 trillion of that is bacterium, right? Uh, believe it or not, we, we, we need help in living and we have, we have more bacterium than we do human cells. That's kind of crazy to think about, but we have about 30 trillion uh, human cells. That's a lot. 
And every side, inside of every one of those cells, with few exceptions, you know, like red blood cells, we have this process of the manual, the reading of the manual, the creating of parts, the diagnosing of parts, the moving and shuttling of parts, getting them to the right place at the right time. They're like miniature cities, and it's happening in every one of those cells. Here's a Yale paleontologist. Now, thinking about that three-year-old, that blind three-year-old messing with the manuals, making cuts and, and making marks and, and making changes. And Elizabeth Verba says the idea that organisms are so complex that it is very hard to change one aspect without wrecking everything else. And as we, we can imagine in our example of the, the airplane manuals, that would seem very logically true. That making a change here is going to have a dramatic impact somewhere down the road as long as that change happened not to be a neutral change, like we talked about the, the color of the seats, for example. So evolution is supposed to be changed over time. That single cell bacterium is never going to become anything other than a single cell bacterium unless you change the manual. Now I never argue, well I, I argue very little anyway, I, I tend to, to make statements rather than, than make an argument, uh, for example. But evolution is change over time. So evolutionists say that, well don't you believe in change over time? And I say, well sure. You can't take any species alive on Earth today and through observation over time tell me that that species doesn't change in slight ways over time. Of course I believe that living things change in slight ways over time. What I don't believe is that one species changes into a completely different species. Just like that airplane being randomly changed to somehow support flying back and forth into space. Uh, it, takes, it takes too many changes, purposeful changes, not blind random changes to make something like that happen. So I do believe in change over time, uh, but that change has to be upwards. Again, think of that single cell bacteria, it's got to change upward into other living things. It can't have just minor changes or near neutral changes. It's got to have major changes. That single cell doesn't know how to make an eye. Somehow it's got to get instructions on how to make an eye. It doesn't have a brain. Where do those instructions come from? It doesn't have a skeletal system, a muscular system, circulatory system. It doesn't have any, any of these organs that humans have. Where do those instructions come from? Well, it has to get them from that blind three-year-old making changes to the manual. That's the only place that it could come from. So change over time is observable. Nobody denies that. But that's not the evolution that I'm talking about. We need to get our words clear. I'm talking about macroevolution big changes over time, not these small changes we observe today that's, that's, uh, we, we experience. What we see is evolution's engine takes things in the wrong direction. Over time it takes them downward, and this has been documented time and time again. Nearly every disease that's known to man comes from a genetic mistake, a genetic change that's not desirable, a mutation that's in, in a place that's not good. This is what we observe, and I think the rest really is just fantasy. When you have no evidence or no observation to back it up, that's when we step out of the realm of science and we step into the realm of fantasy. If we go back to the scripture, go back to Genesis chapter 1, it's recorded 10 times that living things reproduce after their own kind. Now again, I'll say this over and over, I don't believe the Bible is a scientific textbook. I'm not going to go to med school armed with just a Bible in my hand. That'll never work. However, where Scripture touches on science, and in this case, where it touches on biology, we have to believe that the Scripture is true. And this is what we see. We back this up with our observation. Do any living thing ever reproduce something other than its own kind? And we'll talk more about those kinds when we get into uh, the flood of Genesis 6, 7, and 8. But for now, this is something experiential. Cattle produce cattle, horse produce horse, right? You have certain breeds that can uh, intermix with each other, but like, like dogs, for example, but they're all dogs. Nothing ever produces something other than its own kind. God said it 10 times. We can take that and we can launch our biology. We can launch our science based on that, knowing we're never gonna get anything outside of the living kind reproducing after its own kind. Not only do we see that, happening in real life, we see it in the fossil layers. I talked about in a previous session, you know, salamanders, supposedly 18 million years old, no difference to modern living salamanders. Things appear in the fossil record fully formed as a species and they exit just as quickly, fully formed without changing into anything else. This is observation, this is what we see.
But there's another problem that we need to think about. If we're going to hold on to this idea of evolution, that somehow evolution did take place and this blind three-year-old is responsible for it all, then we need to think about this. What if after every change that three-year-old made to this complex set of manuals, that someone came in the room right after she made the change and corrected it, put it back the way it was? Are we really ever going to get anything other than an airplane if this process happened every time? Well, you know what? This is exactly what happens in our DNA. As these mistakes happen, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that here in just a second. But as these mistakes happen, there are workers in the cell, there are enzymes that can detect these mistakes and they come right along behind it and they repair those mistakes for the most part. How does this affect the DNA? How does this affect the evolutionary process? If that single cell, which they do have these error correction mechanisms, how are they ever going to get bigger and better and, and new functions and new organs if after every change something comes along behind it and repairs it and corrects it, put it back the way it was? The evolutionary process can't even get off the ground. The airplane will always be an airplane. The single cell will always be a single cell with this process. So let's take a, take a look at these, these accidents, these mistakes that happen. When do they happen? Well, they, they happen most often during replication. Yes, most of our cells, not all of them, do, do replicate. They divide, they separate. One cell becomes two, two becomes four, four becomes eight. You get the idea. Uh, well, why do they do that? Uh, well, you can think of an example. Say you, uh, you skin your knee, something that happens uh, a lot in my household, uh, by me actually. So w when, when, I, when this happens, when the knee is, is, uh, is skinned and there's a little laceration there, a little cut, the skin cells around that, that laceration communicate with one another. Say so it's time to kick into uh, replication mode. And they, they replicate and they build more and more and more skin cells, right? And, and you want that around that area because you want it repaired. Now, this is in addition to the clotting factor, which is a whole other miracle of biology. But we do want our cells to replicate. And then as they replicate so many times, we, uh, we don't want them to continue replicating forever. Um, that's how cancer uh, gets into our bodies. We have a cell that's got this runaway replication process. But, but normally, cells know when to stop. Say, hey, I've, I've done my time. Um, I've replicated X amount of times, it's time for me to go away, and the cell's recycled. But during this replication process, remember the DNA, the manual, that's inside of, of these cells. If you're going to have two cells out of one, you need to have two copies of the manual, because each of those cells need to have its own copy of the manual. Well, the cell takes care of this perfectly. So during replication, at a specific point, it starts replicating the DNA, the instruction set. So that when that cell divides, you wind up with two cells, each with its own copy. When those copies are made, this is when most of the mistakes are introduced. We call them mutations. Sometimes they're called point mutations. How often does this happen? Well, cell replication takes place about two trillion times every day in the average human. Lots of replication going on. Is this the opportunity for lots of mistakes? You bet it is. How many? About one quintillion mistakes every day during this copy process. That's 10 to the 18th power. That's a one with 18 zeros after it. Think of it as a million billion. This is a lot of mistakes. Well, that doesn't, uh, doesn't seem to be right. If, we're, if this many mistakes is accumulating or, or happening in our, our DNA and our code, shouldn't we have all kinds of weird things uh, you know, as a result of it? We would, except... The error process comes along, thankfully, saves the day. It doesn't correct everything, but it gets it down to about 200 copy errors a day. Out of that quintillion errors that take place on average, the correction mechanism comes back and reduces that to a mere 200. A drop in the bucket compared to the, the amount of information we have in our manuals, just 200 a day. Absolutely incredible. Well, how long do you think we could survive, any living thing could survive, without this DNA error correction mechanism? Not very long at all. Remember, I said nearly every major disease known to man can be traced back to a mutation or a genetic problem, something not right, where we have an original set of instructions that have been changed somehow, and it's not a good change, and it leads to disease. Well, we would have those diseases a lot earlier in life. We wouldn't live very long at all.
I don't know what the estimation is, but I, I put the estimate maybe a couple of years uh, at best. Human race would go extinct well within one generation if we didn't have this error correction mechanism. So again, thinking about the, that instruction manual, if, we're gonna, if, if evolution is true, we have to change the manual. But when we have things coming right along behind those changes and fixing almost nearly all of them, that change will never happen. It's never gonna go upward. And the changes we do see are neutral or lethal. Again, going back to critical thinking. Now this time, instead of asking a critical question of, of evolutionary ideology, let's, let's take it back to scripture. Because in Genesis 131, God says it is all very good. His creation was good. Do you think that Adam and Eve were accumulating genetic errors as their cells divided every day? I don't think so. I don't think that could be a part of God's very good creation. So if we put on our critical thinking hats, knowing what we know about what happened in Genesis chapter 3 when Adam and Eve sinned, Remember, he gave these punishments, and it was a short list. It's certainly by no means meant to be, here's everything that's going to change. But he told Adam, here's, here's what's going to change for you. Here's an idea. It's going to be harder, right? To work in the ground, tending the garden, it's going to be harder. By the sweat of your brow, he says. Uh, Eve had her own set of things that were going to be harder. Um, it could be that when sin was introduced in the world, you know, God was sustaining it all anyway. Couldn't he have just held back some of his sustaining power. And I think we get a glimpse of that in Colossians 1.17. It says, In him all things consist and hold together. If he's holding it together to begin with, and he just hold, lets it back a little bit, that would introduce enough of the chaos that we see today. This is one big problem, I think, for the atheists that I talk to, is how can you believe in God when we look around and we see things like cancer and disease and things that affect children and, and all this bad and, and how the design in our bodies is not optimal? Well, according to Scripture, it was optimal. It was very, very good. And when Adam introduced sin, things changed. And this is what we see today, the results of that sin and things getting continually worse and worse and worse. I'm not saying the world's a bad place. I'm saying, genetically speaking, nothing is getting better. We're all winding down, so, so to speak. Geneticists will tell you the human race is on a, a path to extinction with no way to reverse it. That matches what I read in Scripture. When sin was introduced, some bad things happened. And going back to, to, to David, here we'll wrap this session up. In Psalms 139, 14, I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. And this time, I'm going to look at that last sentence. Again, David didn't have a fraction of the knowledge of the human system in biology, at least I, presumably so, that he didn't have that knowledge. We had so much more knowledge, yet he knew that he was wonderfully made, and he gave credit to his Creator. How did he know? He says, my soul knows it very well. When we go back to Genesis and we reread the account of the creation of Adam in Genesis chapter 2, God says he, he breathed the breath of life into Adam and he became a living soul. There's something about humans that's different than the rest of creation. That we have this peace of God that God give to us and, and when we die, when we pass from this life, that goes back to God and he decides what to do with it from there. When I say that this isn't a salvation issue, that you can believe in evolution if you want, remember the session we talked about all the snowball, the, the, the slippery slope that it causes in Scripture to where you've got to compromise on so many passages of Scripture that at some point, what are you left with? You're left with a book that you're saying, eh, this can't all be true. Now that is a salvation issue and can lead you to turn away from God. It's very important that as Christians we maintain a worldview that's based on Scripture because Scripture never changes. Thank you all so much for your attention. In our next session, we'll take this DNA example and we'll go just a little bit deeper into the amazing creation that uh, God has made for us. Thank you.